Hello, and welcome to Spring Lobby Weekend 2021. My name is Larissa Gil Sanhuesa, and I'm the Young Adult Advocacy Coordinator and your MC this afternoon. I'm so looking forward to a weekend of advocacy and action with y'all. Our second virtual conference a year into this pandemic, and I am even more grateful for those of you who are joining us this weekend. This year, we were forced to connect and create community online and from afar. And I don't know about y'all, but I definitely felt it. I'm tired, but I could not be more proud of the work we have achieved as a network of advocates. Up against the fact that all of our workloads seemed to triple in the last year, against the fact that we have been kept apart from each other, and against the fact that we are tackling systems of violence and racism in the middle of a global pandemic, we are coming together this weekend. I learned so much from the advocates in this network, and I hope we can continue to learn from each other over the next couple days. Now, in case you are new to our network, hello, welcome. The Friends Committee on National Legislation is a Quaker nonprofit nonpartisan lobbying organization. Excuse me. As Quakers, our advocacy is grounded in values of peace, equality, stewardship, and justice. In our work, we are guided by the principle that there is inherent dignity and humanity or an inner light in every person. For that reason, we base our advocacy in relationship building and storytelling. If you want to learn more about how Quakerism informs our work, we will have workshops that dive into this more today and tomorrow, as well as time for centering Quaker worship tomorrow morning that you are encouraged to check out, even if you have never tried it before. This weekend, we are here to push for national legislation that helps end police violence. Congress has the opportunity to act now and finally pass meaningful reforms. And our voices will help make this happen. But this is only a first step in the movement to end police violence. According to Bill Moyer, a Quaker social change activist and organizer, we need advocates, rebels, helpers, and organizers within any social movement. In the movement to end police violence, some of us have been rebels by protesting in the streets. Some of us have been helpers by providing lodging or water to protesters and other forms of direct service. Some of us have been organizers, bringing people together, educating them to demand change. Some of us, have held many of those roles. This weekend, we will be advocates, ensuring that Congress hears us and plays its role in setting national standards to help end police violence. We had over 500 of you register for this event, representing 43 states. Friends, this is our power. Just how many of us are willing to dedicate this time to learn and lobby? And just how far our influence will reach this weekend? 70 Senate offices and 98 House offices will hear from constituents this weekend and the importance of legislation that helps end police violence. Now, throughout the weekend, you will meet some of our wonderful young adult leaders with videos that were sent from around the country. Thanks to those of you who sent videos, we can't be together in person, but we can at least remind ourselves of the fact that we are sharing in community this weekend. Let's play our first one now. Howdy y'all from Texas. My name is Istra Furman and I am an advocacy court organizer working in San Antonio, Texas. I'm so excited to be with all of you virtually soon. Hello from Fayetteville, Arkansas. My name is Hope and I am the delegation leader for Arkansas for Spring Lobby Weekend. I'm so excited to have you lobby with us. Whoopee! 
Hello from Indianapolis, Indiana. My name is Carlos Moran. I'm very excited to be with you guys. Hello from Washington, DC. My name is Hannah Sievers and I'm the program assistant for Young Adult Outreach here at FCNL. We are so excited to have you lobby with us. Awesome. I love those videos. It really is getting me excited to be here with y'all. Throughout the weekend, please take selfies and pictures of the sessions that you're in and post them on social media, tagging FCNL. You can find our social media handles on the top of the screen. And I'll encourage you all to take a selfie with me now. If you were here last year, you remember the importance of uh, you know, actually joining in community and showing everyone what we're doing this weekend. So let's just take a second to do that now. Awesome. Don't forget that if you are posting that, please use the hashtag, hashtag end police violence. We want people to know, like I said, why we're gathered this weekend and how important it is that we advocate on this issue, even virtually. Now, I want to know where the rest of y'all are from. We obviously couldn't get videos from every single person that's attending. So please take this moment to hop in the YouTube chat and say your name and where you're calling in from. If you're part of a group, you can tell us that as well. And we'll be using YouTube and the chat function to answer your questions throughout the weekend. Monitoring the chat on YouTube will be our amazing Annie Chirazi, who is the senior manager for events and programming. Basically the person that made sure this whole event came together. We are so grateful for Annie and she will be making sure that your questions are answered throughout the next couple hours. All right, hey Annie, how are you today? Larissa, I am so grateful to be here, um, coming straight out of YouTube headquarters. Now, it may look an awfully lot like Capitol Hill to you, but trust me, I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley right now, um, beaming in from YouTube, and I'm in this chat, and there is so much fun stuff going on. Folks are joining us from all over. We have uh, someone coming in from El... El, El Ellicott City in uh, Maryland. We have Sergey from Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, we have Sydney from Carolina Friends School. Uh, I think I even saw your sister, Vanessa, joining us um, from Altoona, Pennsylvania, and I had to shout that out. Uh, we have Libby from Messiah University. People coming in from Chicago, Miami, all over my home state of Arizona. It's so great to see all of you here. Awesome. Thank you for shouting all those people out. And yes, hi to my sister. <laughs> uh, there are so many people from so many different places. That's great. And Annie, will you be the only person monitoring the chat? No, thank you so much for asking. So I will be in this chat. You'll also see FCNL, uh, our, our standard, uh, our company group in this chat. And then Amelia Keegan is also uh, reviewing the chat. And Amelia Keegan actually is the head of our domestic policy team. And so when we get to the policy conversation later, any questions that I don't know how to answer about the legislation, she'll be in here answering as well. So we have you well covered. Um, keep telling us where you're tuning in from, keep engaging, and don't forget to give us a like and a share if you're enjoying Spring Lobby Weekend. Thank you, Annie. And thank you, Amelia, for also helping us answer questions. Okay, so what do we have in store for us this weekend? Throughout our time together, we will be referencing two links that you should all be visiting to find everything you need to know for this event. The first one of those links is fcnl.org slash SLW schedule. Here you will find the schedule and all relevant links that you need to join our programming. Annie is putting that link in the chat now. Thank you, Annie. So let's go over the schedule for today. From now until 3.30 p.m. Eastern, we will be in full lobby training mode to make sure that you are totally comfortable and feeling ready to lobby on Monday. Our lobbyists for justice reform and election integrity, Jose Was and Cameron Point, We'll take us through what we need to know about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, a piece of legislation that would set meaningful reforms to help end police violence. 
you will learn what this bill does and how to talk about it with your legislators, even the ones that might give you a lot of pushback. After hearing from them, I will come back on screen to go over stories with y'all. We all have a story to tell. And like I said earlier, our advocacy is rooted in this. So what is a story you might be asking yourself? You'll find out in less than an hour. So once we've gone over these basics, what legislation are we talking about? What is a story? What does a lobby visit actually sound like? You will be heading into Zoom meetings with other people from your state to prepare for your visits and practice. This is happening from 2 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern. In this room leading the training will be a member of FCNL staff ready to help you structure your lobby visit. Now they're going to do the best they can to answer policy questions as well, but I'll take this moment to skip ahead in the schedule and point out that there are office hours with the lobbyists both today and tomorrow. Today, they are being held from 5.15 to 6 p.m. Eastern. I highly recommend taking advantage of these since not all of us at FCNL are experts on this issue, but we want to make sure that you get all of your questions answered. There will also be time in the schedule tomorrow to meet again with your lobby groups if you feel you need more practice. After the lobby training, we will have our first set of workshops from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern. But I'm going to ask our program assistant for young adult outreach, Hannah Sievers, to talk about these for y'all. Many of you have probably chatted with Hannah over the last couple months as she fearlessly led our recruitment and outreach efforts for this event. Hey, Hannah, thanks for coming on to talk about these workshops. I know that you gave particular thought to this set. So do you wanna talk about what participants can expect? Sure, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, these workshops will be about careers, giving you the opportunity to network with professionals and to further develop your interviewing skills. For example, I'll be running a workshop on how to perfect your elevator pitch for when you are at networking events and career fairs. Awesome. Well, besides the one that you're running, Hannah, is there another workshop that you're excited about? Yeah. One of the workshops I'm especially excited to have offered to everyone is the Roundtable of Internships and Fellowships. We recognize that young adults are hard workers that deserve to be compensated for that work. And we wanna utilize the other organizations in our network to showcase some awesome paid opportunities for young adults. That also sounds great. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you for all the work that you did to make this event meaningful for participants. So, so, so grateful for you. Thank you. All right, well, that's the schedule, folks. Learning and training until 3.30 p.m. Eastern, workshops from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern, and office hours from 5.15 to 6 p.m. Eastern. Before we really get started, however, I do have one last thing to ask of y'all. Tomorrow, we will have birds of a feather gathering times. What is this exactly? It's an opportunity for attendees to meet other attendees that share similar identities, lived experiences, or interests. This is a fun, informal way to connect with other people at this conference. There will be seven gathering spaces with three of them predetermined as spaces for LGBTQ plus BIPOC participants, that is Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and Quaker slash Quaker curious. That means there are four more spaces with no assignment yet, and that's where you all come in. We want you to submit ideas for what the other four could be, and we will confirm them tonight by 8 p.m. Eastern. So be sure to send in your request before the end of programming today. You can submit requests at fcnl.org slash feather, and you also received the link in the email that you got from us last night with details for today. Um, and Annie should have already put that short link in the chat, if not, it's showing up now. 
So moving right along, I'm going to ask Annie to join me again to talk about something new and fun we're trying. We know how hard the last year has been and we know that it's disappointing. We can't meet in Washington DC to walk over to Capitol Hill, it's right behind me over there and lobby together. But like I said earlier, it is clear that we are a group of determined advocates because against the odds, we organized ourselves to be here and take action. For that reason, we want to thank you for the work you are doing and thank you for your time and energy. We're a community and it's important that we remember we're all human at the end of the day. So Annie, how exactly are we going to thank our attendees for participating in Spring Lobby Weekend this year? Uh, Larissa, I am so grateful to all of our advocates that are joining us here today. And like you said, we're sad that we can't all physically be together this year, but we still want to celebrate everything that we're accomplishing as this amazing, powerful group uh, virtually on Capitol Hill. So we have some amazing prizes uh, in store if you participate in Spring Lobby Weekend. Firstly, if you attend your Saturday lobby training, so what's happening later today, this afternoon, and you also go to at least one lobby visit on Monday, you're going to receive in the mail a certificate of lobbying from FCNL. And that's something that's awesome that you can put on your resume um, and that you can brag about to all of your friends. And then if you do that, you so you both attend a lobby training and at least one lobby visit, and you fill out all three of the daily surveys. The first one is in your inbox now. It was sent out yesterday um, in the evening. If you fill out the daily survey today, tomorrow, and for Monday, um, you are going, you stand a chance to win one of these fantastic t-shirts. And I am not just blowing smoke here. These are truly the softest t-shirts that you will ever feel in your life. And you're going to have to have one yourself. You will want it. You will love it. They are long sleeve. They are cozy. They take you from season to season. I just can't speak highly enough of them. So on the front, they say, this is what a lobbyist looks like. And on the back, they do say spring lobby weekend. Um, so again, to win this, all you have to do is be here with us, fill out the daily surveys. Um, and then also uh, in those daily surveys, we're going to be asking you for secret words and phrases. So what does that mean? Basically in all of our things that are hap programming that's happening in Zoom meetings, so any workshops, any coffee talks, um, office hours, any of that programming, near the end of the programming, the people who are facilitating will give you a secret um, word or phrase and you just fill those into um, those daily daily surveys and those are each worth 10 points um, and then the reason the points matter is because we're actually going to have grand prizes so we are going to have a first second and third prize which is a 200 100 or 50 dollar certificate um, gift certificate respectively so Definitely want to be filling out those daily surveys. Definitely want to be getting all of those secret phrases and words. And then every single survey has also an open-ended question. So that's your chance to really tell us why Spring Lobby Weekend is important to you, what you're getting out of this amazing experience. And we're going to judge that between 10 and 50 points. So I just said a lot, but all of this information is also going to be um, at fcnl.org slash SLW prizes. And I'm going to be putting that in the chat in just a moment. Um, but basically, it's really exciting. You're almost guaranteed if you uh, just lobby with us, you are guaranteed to get that certificate. It doesn't take that much more to get this, again, amazing shirt. Um, and then also, you also have the opportunity to win some big cash prizes. So please, please, please play along. Thank you so much. Thank you, Annie. I can also validate that the t-shirts are very, very soft. <laughs> um, all right, I'm excited to see how everyone does. Now let's take a look at who it is you'll be lobbying and potentially competing with for these grand prizes. Let's check in with more of our advocates from around the country. Hi, my name is Maria Rollins Sims, and I'm currently at the Florida Mall at the parking lot where an Orange County deputy fatally shot Slade this moment, a young black man who was fleeing in fear of his life. 
I am representing Florida International University. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Alyssa Vandenbark and I'm joining Spring Lobby Weekend as the delegation leader from Haverford College in Pennsylvania. We hope to see you there. Hello from Mount Rainier. My name is Grace Green and I'm the Washington State Delegation Leader. I'm so excited for Spring Lobby Weekend. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm James at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. See you at Spring Lobby Weekend. Hey everyone, my name is Zay Cloud. I'm from Lima, Ohio. And today, I'm sitting outside at the University of Mount Union on our kissing bridge. Rumor has it if you kiss someone on this bridge, you two will be married. Thanks everyone. I love that last video. Thank you, Zay, for sending that in. All right, now I'm really excited to introduce a message from Senator Cory Booker. As many of you might know, Senator Booker was the lead sponsor of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act in the Senate last year. This is the bill that we will be focusing on this weekend. New Jersey Senator Cory Booker has been a longtime champion of legislation to address racism, mass incarceration, and the urgency of addressing the climate of police violence in our country. In fact, he was the keynote speaker at our Spring Lobby Weekend in 2016, when we lobbied for legislation to address sentencing reform. And we are so happy to have Cory Booker join us again. Although the Senator wasn't able to be here in person, he did record this special video message to help us get our Lobby Weekend off to a good start. Thank you all for coming together to lobby against unjustified police violence. We have work to do in our nation. We are a country where you see African-Americans dramatically more likely uh, to be shot and killed by the police. That we still have issues of police brutality. That the mentally ill in our country, those who are struggling with mental illness, face dramatically higher rates of being subject to police unjustified violence and to being shot by the police and killed by the police unjustifiably also. We have work to do. And so I wanna thank you all for gathering together, for standing and working, not just being bystanders to injustice, but upstanders to making this nation live up to its promise. As one of the United States senators that helped to write the Justice in Policing Act, the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, I'm proud to say that we are continuing to fight for substantive and needed reforms. We recently got that bill again in this Congress passed through the House of Representatives, and now we are working on negotiations to try to advance substantive police reform through the United States Senate and ultimately the House and to the President's desk for his signature. Change does not come from Washington, as often is said. It comes to Washington by activists, by leaders, by people who love this nation and know that we have to work for our highest ideals. Thank you for being in that tradition. We know that civil rights wasn't passed because people in Washington came around to it. No, it was passed because of activism, because of leadership in the grassroots. We know that suffrage did not come around for women because a bunch of men in Washington got around to it. It came because of protest, because of demand, because of lobbying and petitioning. What you are doing is a proud and noble tradition, and I'm grateful for you standing together and working together for change, for justice, so that we can be a nation that lives up to our oath as a country for liberty, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you again, Senator Booker and his team for sending in those remarks. I am ready to take on this training with y'all. Like I said earlier, we will start with Jose Waz and Cameron Point, our lobbyists for justice reform and election integrity, who will take us through the ask, what we will be asking our legislators to do when we speak with them on Monday, and some context into the history of this legislation. Before we do that, we're gonna take a quick break, but stick around, just stretch your legs maybe for a second, and we will hear from Jose and Cameron when we return.
And we're back. Uh, I told you it was going to be a short break. <laughs> so we're now going to hear from Jose and Cameron. We hope that during this time, you will not hesitate to ask questions in the chat. As Annie mentioned earlier, Amelia Keegan, our legislative director for domestic policy, will answer some of the questions directly in the chat. But we will also ask Jose and Cameron to answer some of those questions as well when we get to um, uh, a, a later portion in, in this section. So now I'm going to invite Jose Santos Was, our legislative manager for justice reform and election integrity, and Cameron Point, the program assistant for justice reform and election integrity. Thank you both for being here and getting us ready for this really important advocacy. Jose, I'm going to start with you. Why are we here this weekend? Yes, thank you, Larissa. And thank you to everyone here with us today. Your advocacy here and now is so important for meaningful and lasting change. Now, to really illustrate why this advocacy is important, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you all a story. I will be describing police violence for the next 30 seconds, so please do what you need to take care of yourself. Imagine that you need groceries and walk to the store. You pay with a $20 bill. The store owner thinks you just paid with a counterfeit bill. You walk outside and are confronted by police. You're confronted by police and eventually the situation escalates and you are on the ground. An officer places his knee on your neck and you feel your life slip away. This is a murder, plain and simple. Police are the literal foot soldiers of white supremacy, starting with slave patrols two centuries ago. Black people view police with suspicion, with good reason. They overplace our communities, and too often, when they are confronted by police, it involves harassment, even violence. We've seen change. Starting at a local level, 27 states have adopted new police oversight and reform laws, according to the National Conference of State Legislatures. In November, voters approved 17 ballot measures in six states to rein in police officers. But we still need change at a national level. There are 18,000 different police organizations in the United States, and we can't wait for them to each act individually. We need national standards now. Thank you, Jose. Um, it, it gives me a little bit of hope to hear that changes are happening at a local level and that advocates have wasted no time in addressing this issue. But that's also why I find it even more frustrating that Congress has not done the same. There should be no question in anyone's mind that this is a priority. And that's why we are advocating for Congress to act now during our lobby visits. Cameron, I wanna to turn to you. I mentioned earlier a couple times that we will be focusing on the George Floyd Justice in Policing Act, H.R. 1280. What would this legislation do to address police violence? Thank you, Larissa, for that question. And thank you all, our advocates across the nation lobbying this weekend. I cannot thank you enough. Your advocacy is so crucial. So to answer your question, Larissa, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act would implement many important reforms to transform policing culture across the nation by setting national standards for all American police departments to follow. We'll learn more about what exactly those standards are in a bit. But currently, all 18,000 police jurisdictions in the United States do not have to follow national standards of conduct. If a police department chooses not to implement the reforms in the Justice and Policing Act once it's passed, then that department is at risk of losing federal funding. The federal government can help address police violence by implementing those national standards for police departments across the country to follow. This is not the only tool in addressing police violence but it is an important one that's within our grasp. So Cameron, uh, thank you for that. What would you say to someone about why this issue is urgent and why we should be lobbying now? Thank you, Larissa. You know, it's been over a year since Breonna Taylor was murdered and no comprehensive policing reform legislation has passed through Congress. It has been nearly a year since the murder of George Floyd, and yet 
no comprehensive policing reform legislation has come from Congress. Quite frankly, Rissa, it's insulting to those whose lives were taken by the police, to their loved ones, and to the value of Black lives. The House started great work by passing the Justice and Policing Act twice now, last summer and again earlier this month. We must build on this momentum to see it finally pass in the Senate as well. We cannot and we will not remain silent until killings at the hands of the police stop. We cannot allow partisan politics to drown out our continued demands for justice. To put this even more into perspective, according to the Journal of Epidemiology and Public Health, in each of the last five years, more than 1,000 people a year have died at the hands of police, over 1,000. There were only 18 days in 2022 and 2020 where police did not kill someone. That's only 18 days in 2020 where the police did not kill someone. Black people make up less than 13% of the entire United States population, but we are killed by police at almost three times the rate of white Americans. Thank you, Cameron. Now we've been talking about changes at, I mean, I'm hearing both of you say the local and national level. Specifically, we heard that changes are already happening at a local level. Jose, can you tell us what is the federal government's role in local policing? And maybe say something about how this advocacy fits in with local advocacy around the country? Yes. It's important to remember that the majority of funding for police comes from, from the local and state governments. And the bulk of the change to policing must and is occurring on the local level. The national government has a role to play in setting universal standards of policing. A floor. As a nation, we simply can't have 18,000 separate law enforcement jurisdictions with drastically different approaches to policing and continue to have no unified basic understanding of proper standards. Here's some numbers to help you understand the two major federal government programs providing funding for local police. In fiscal year 2019, about 260 million in funding was available to all, pol all local police departments through the Burn Justice Assistance Grant Program, a federal grant program that funds police. The Community Oriented Policing Service or COPS office provided another 400 million last year to law enforcement. So that's a total of about $660 million in federal government grants for the entire country. By way of comparison, the New York Police Department, the NYPD, the nation's largest police department alone, their budget was $5.3 billion, billion would it be. And that's just one of the 18,000 police and jurisdictions in the country. So federal funding is a relatively small portion of the funding that local police jurisdictions receive. What we believe is that the federal government's primary role should be to set standards, banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants and the other elements of the George Floyd Justice, Justice and Policing Act. In my home state of New Jersey, in Camden, once considered one of the most, the, the most dangerous city in America, the police department was disbanded in 2012 and rebuilt from the ground up. The city has reduced violent crimes violent crime rates substantially, and they also uh, reduce um, its excessive use of force complaints as well. Thank you, Jose, for that example too. Um, now, shifting gears a bit, uh, this, this is still for you, Jose. I recently read that the movement for Black Lives has come out against the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act as an effective solution to this problem. And that is really important for us to address. So can you say something about that? I also read that statement. The first thing to say is that the Justice and Policing Act does not do anywhere near all that needs to be done. We want a lot more. And at the same time, we don't want another year to pass without federal legislation to set national standards for the 18,000 different police jurisdictions in the country. There's a broad movement in this country to address police violence and everyone has to decide where they want to fit into that movement. I don't think what FCNL does is the only or the most important work. 
but I do believe it is work that needs to be done. I ask myself, what is our comparative, comparative advantage at this moment in time? Today, right here, we've got 500 people getting ready to go into congressional offices on Monday. And our comparative advantage, your comparative advantage, is you are lobbying members of Congress in more than 40 states. And almost half of those members of Congress you are meeting with are Republicans. This is partly a question of math in the current Congress. In the Senate, there isn't complete support for Justice and Policing Act, even among Democrats, never mind among Republicans. So we are going to have to work real hard this weekend. And in the coming weeks, to get these reforms in the Justice and Policing Act done. But even when these reforms are done, we aren't going to stop there. We're going to keep working for more. I don't want to miss this opportunity to persuade Congress to take a first step of many necessary steps toward addressing this historic injustice, and we believe we should seize this moment. Well, Jose, um, that same article mentioned the BREATHE Act, uh, which was introduced in the last session of Congress. And it, it is described as a comprehensive piece of legislation that eliminates agencies and reallocates funding. Can you talk a little bit about this piece of legislation? Yes, that's a much stronger bill on these issues and it covers a much wider range of policies. Unfortunately, it has not been introduced yet. I see a lot that I like in the draft that I've seen. I'm looking forward to reading the bill more closely once it is introduced and we can understand what our strategy is. Great, well, thank you both for sharing those insights. Um, you know, what really stuck out to me from this discussion is that change is and must continue to occur on all levels of government. We support grassroots movements for change while simultaneously calling on Congress to do their part in addressing police violence. One of the ways they can do that is creating national standards of practices for all 18,000 police jurisdictions across the country. Uh, that, that number just you know, always blows my mind every time we talk about it. Um, and they, they currently have no unified or universal standards. So next, we are going to dive into learning about what's in this year's lobby ask. Literally, what we will be asking our legislators to do when we lobby them. But first, um, I did mention there will be two very important links that we'll be referencing throughout this weekend. The first one was for the schedule. And now this second link is for all of the lobby visit materials that you'll need. And that link is fcnl.org slash SLW resources. Annie should be putting that in the chat now. Thank you again, Annie. One thing that you will find on that page is our one page leave behind, which is the one page summary of what we hope Congress will do. When we are lobbying in person, we literally leave this document behind in congressional offices for the members and their staff. In a virtual world, this can be emailed to the office as follow-up. This provides the core arguments for why we believe the Justice and Policing Act is so important and also provides details of four key provisions that we hope you will raise during your lobby visits on Monday. So now let's bring back Cameron and Jose. They're not done yet. <laughs> Jose, can you walk us through what it is specifically that we are asking Congress to do? For Spring Lobby Weekend, our congressional ask is to co-sponsor and pass the meaningful reforms included in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, H.R. 1280. This bill started in a tragedy, and we shouldn't forget that. This should be the focal point. We want to save lives, and the federal government needs to act. So we've mentioned a couple times there are provisions within the bill. So um, Cameron, what are those provisions that are included in the bill we're advocating for? 
Great question, Larissa. And we'll be repeating these four provisions all throughout the weekend and make sure you have them down for your lobby visits on Monday. So the four reforms that we are asking Congress to pass this weekend are one, ban chokeholds. Uh, Derek Chauvin used a chokehold to murder George Floyd. Police should not be able to restrict airflow to lungs and ban no-knock warrants. It's been a year this month since the murder of Breonna Taylor and nothing has been done. Second, reform the 1033 program. This is a program that transfers equipment intended for war zones to our local police. We shouldn't still be sending tanks into our cities. Our police should not look like troops. Third, reform qualified immunity. It's almost impossible to bring civil cases against police unless there's a previous case where an officer acted almost identically. And because criminal cases rarely succeed, our current system allows police to murder people and not be prosecuted or held accountable in court. The fourth reform is increase use of force standard for lethal force and mandate de-escalation techniques. Too often, police pull a gun in a situation where de-escalation techniques could have worked. I'm gonna repeat those four reforms you are going to be asking Congress to enact during your lobby visits on Monday. Again, the four reforms are ban chokeholds and no-knock warrants, reform the 1033 program, reform qualified immunity, raise use of force standard, and require de-escalation techniques. We are asking Congress during spring lobby weekend to pass these meaningful reforms to help address the epidemic of police violence. Although those are the four main points of the bill we're lobbying on, these are not the only necessary reforms for policing. Thank you, Cameron. Now, can you walk us through the specific questions we should ask on a lobby visit? I heard either you or Jose say earlier that this bill has already passed the House. So how do we navigate our different lobby visits? Absolutely. So remember, our legislative ask for Congress is to pass the meaningful reforms included in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, as it says in our legislative leave behind. We have some very basic but very effective questions that everyone can use on their lobby visits to gain more insight about an office's relationship to the legislation. These questions that I'm about to go over can be found in your virtual lobby visit roadmap on our Spring Lobby Resources page. The first question to ask every office is, do or did you support the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act that passed the House? You can also research this question in advance to see whether your representative voted in favor of a legislation earlier this month, or whether your senators were co-sponsors of a legislation in the last, uh, in last Congress. If they are in favor of the legislation, if they voted yes or co-sponsors, uh, then a follow-up question will be, how will you ensure that this remains a priority for the House and Senate leadership. If your representative or senator says they do not support the Justice and Policing Act, then try this question. If you don't support the Justice and Policing Act, which of the specific elements, which of our four reforms in our leave behind do you support or can you get behind? Thank you again, Cameron. Those questions do sound like a pretty quick and easy way to facilitate these conversations and lobby visits. And I'll be doing one of the trainings later. So let me just restate to make sure I have it totally down and hopefully this will help others. If a member is supportive of the bill, then we can ask, what can you do to ensure addressing police violence remains a priority among leadership? And if they are unsupportive, then we should ask their positions on each one of the four reforms we are advocating for that are included in the Justice and Policing Act. Do I have that right, Cameron? You nailed it, Larissa. That's absolutely right. Again, those sample questions are available in your virtual lobby visit roadmaps. And thank you for that reminder. Yes, at fcnl.org slash SLW resources, you'll find all of this information to help you with your lobby visits. Now that we know all the basics of the bill, I want to ask a couple more questions to just dive even deeper into this issue and, and how this legislation plays a role. Um, how are we going to get this approved by Congress? Jose, can you answer that question? Thanks, Larissa. The House has passed this bill twice now, but we still need to keep it on the agenda in both chambers. 
We're up on the Hill lobbying on this all the time. There are so many priorities in front of Congress. This must remain our priority. That's where you come in. The math in the Senate is clear. It's important that Congress is meeting with so many different audiences. We need 10 Republicans to co-sponsor in order to be successful in the Senate. We need to keep Congress's feet to the fire so this doesn't just go away. We may not get the legislation called the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act through Congress, but if we can get the key components passed into law, that will be an important accomplishment. With your voices stay engaged, we can get this legislation passed. Thank you, Jose. So what should we be saying to lawmakers who may be unsupportive of the Justice and Policing Act? I'll take that one, Larissa. Um, so we are advocating for the reforms included in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act to be passed. We want the members to be supportive of the whole bill, but during our lobbying, you know, the, the lobbying that Jose and I, and I have done for the last year, we found that that won't always be the case. We wanna start by asking offices to support the Justice and Policing Act, but if we find they're unsupportive of the bill, again, break down the specific four reforms we're advocating for. Ask about their support on each and individual, individual provision. This ensures that members carefully consider each reform we're advocating for. It allows for further conversation than just, the Senator is unsupportive of this bill. You can say, well, you don't, do you support any of the four reforms included in the bill? Can you see yourself supporting this provision, like banning no-knock warrants? This holds your representative accountable and thoroughly engaging with the legislation that you as constituents are advocating for. It makes it more likely that you might find common ground with your member of Congress. Great, so before we get to questions from people around the country, I did promise we would take some questions in a bit. Jose, can you just help us frame the urgency of this issue one more time? We can't dilute this down to politics or an academic discussion of states' rights. We need and want police to not kill black people. The federal government needs to act. This is the oppressive state using its monopoly powers on violence against black people. Republicans stand for liberty and restraining the government from encroaching on our lives. There's no greater encroachment than murder. Congress may have thought this groundswell support for change is going away, but it's not. And all of you are here as evidence. They have a job to do, they represent you. We had 600 people in November and now 500 more today. Letting Congress know we will not stop our advocacy until these reforms are made into a reality. Thank you for that, Jose. That is going to be really important for us all to remember and hold as we are uh, doing this, this advocacy and lobbying our members on Monday. So we do want to open it up now to questions from the audience. If you haven't already been asking questions in the YouTube chat, please do so. Annie is very excited to uh, engage with y'all in that chat. And I know that Amelia is in there as well um, to help out. But we also have a few folks who will be joining us live um, to ask us some questions. Annie, are you ready to help us monitor the chat and get some questions answered? Yes, and I actually just wanna shout out the chat right now. There is some really great dialogue happening here and a lot of nuanced conversation about everything that Jose and Cameron have been telling us about. And so I'm so appreciative to this community of advocates. And I think it really underlines the fact that you really are, you know, experts in this area and you are going to do so amazing on Monday. So super big shout out to all the great dialogue happening there. And I'm excited to get some questions soon. Thanks, Annie. Um, I'm a little jealous. I cannot see what's happening in the YouTube chat, but thank you for uh, holding down the fort at uh, YouTube headquarters. So now we're going to turn it over to our first person joining us by video, and that is Zayana from Florida International University in Florida. Zayana, thank you for being here to ask a question. Thank you for having me. As mentioned, my name is Zayana Griot from Florida, and I'm interested to know who in Congress and beyond supports the legislation. 
Cameron, do you want to take this one? Absolutely. Great question, Diana. Thank you. Um, there is tons of support and momentum surrounding the Justice and Policing Act, and there has been since its introduction last year. You know, overwhelmingly, House Democrats have been very supportive of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Some other examples I can think of are the Leadership Conference, the NAACP. Jose is a co-chair of the Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition. It's a coalition of about 40 faith communities representing people from various faith traditions, from Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, Evangelical, et cetera. And we have a lot of our coalition partners that support this legislation and actively lobby on it, um, as well as their support from the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, also known as Noble, and the White House. Um, little known fact for some people, and maybe a lot of people knew this, but when she was Senator Kamala Harris, she was an original sponsor in the Senate of uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. So there is there is support and we need to keep building on that momentum. Thank you for that question. Yes, thank you, Zayana, and thank you for answering that question, Cameron. Now, I wanna turn to Annie to see if we are getting any questions in the YouTube chat. I know there was a lot of dialogue, but do we have any questions we can answer, Annie? Yeah, absolutely. So there was a question in the chat about the concern that if federal funding is stopped or withheld, uh, if police won't have the resources they need to keep people safe. So I was wondering if someone could talk a little bit about that concern and, and if that's something that we should be concerned about in Hill offices on Monday. Um, Jose, do you want to answer that question? Yeah, I'm happy to. As, as was stated earlier, uh, the majority of funding for local and state law enforcement comes from local and state governments, meaning city councils and state legislatures. Um, with local reforms, one of the fears has been that if you take money away from police, our communities are going to be less safe. Well, that's just not the case. Uh, what many local grassroots activists are asking for is for funding to be diverted to social services and violence interrupters um, to better serve local communities because we've seen uh, a ballooning of state and local funding for law enforcement. Um, so if you take away federal funding, um, I don't think that um, we're gonna be less safe. Um, but just wanna, just wanna reiterate that um, state and local funding and federal funding are very different. And what we want to achieve here are federal national standards with federal funding. Thank you, Jose. And thank you for that question in the chat. Let's move on to another live question from Claudia from Mount Union College in Ohio. Thank you for being with us, Claudia. Are you there? Yeah, hey, thanks for having me. Do you wanna go ahead and uh, answer, or I'm sorry, ask your question? <laughs> sure. Uh, so one of my members of Congress is a Republican, and I will ask him if he supports the Joy George Floyd in Policing Act, but I know he doesn't. What else can I ask him? Okay, I'm going to throw that one back to Jose. Jose, what can Claudia say to her Republican member of Congress? Thanks for that question. No Republicans have supported the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, but as Cameron said earlier, we can challenge Republican offices by asking if they support the specific reforms in the bill. For example, does a representative or senator support banning chokeholds or banning no-knock warrants and the, other, and the other elements listed on the leave behind? And there are four elements. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Claudia. I know that you are not the only person that has a Republican member of Congress that that we'll hear from us on Monday. So I'm sure that's uh, going to be really helpful for others that are listening. Now I wanna throw it back to Annie. Let's go back to YouTube. We are really traveling a lot in these five minutes of questions and answers. Um, Annie, do you have another question from the chat? Yeah, I do. Um, so it's actually a two part question. So uh, asked by two different people. So Philip asks, could you say more about what the 1033 program is? I don't really understand. And then on top of that, we also had the, a really good question of, would police departments also have to give back materials they got previously through the 1033 program um, as part of, of what this bill asks? So what is the 1033 program? And if departments already have those materials, do they have to give them back? Do they keep them? Do we know? 
That is a really good question. Um, I'm gonna give Jose a little break. Uh, Cameron, do you wanna answer one or both parts of that question? Absolutely, and Jose, feel free to jump in if you have something to add um, further. But um, great question, what is the 1033 program? So it is a Pentagon transfer program of, of war zone equipment and, and, and military grade equipment to local police departments. Uh, since it's, its conception, I think that's been about $7.5 billion of equipment that's been transferred from the Pentagon to local police forces. So one of our, our, our former lobbyists, Andre, when he was here at FCNL, he was telling us about his hometown in New Hampshire, and they received a tank <laughs> as a part of the 1033 program. And we just don't need our police looking like military, like they're overseas and they're troops. Um, we see this especially with protesters like last year, a lot of them were equi equipped with heavy military gear to interact with protesters in a violent way, in a very militarized way. So that's what the 1033 program is. And we're really advocating for it to get rid of all of these offensive um, military, uh, uh, military designed equipment to be transferred to lo local police departments. As for the retroactive um, giving back the equipment, Jose, is that, is that true that uh, they do give it back? So if this were to pass, any department that is under investigation for violating civil liberties or um, any department that's been um, litigated and found to have abused civil liberties of their, of their constituents must return that equipment. Awesome question. Thank, thank you, you both. Question. Yeah, thank you. All right, so let's take one more live question. And for that, I would like to welcome Nora from Amnesty International Dallas in Texas. <laughs> Nora, are you there? Yes, thank you for having me. As stated, my name is Nora Jandras and I'm from Southern Methodist University. And I would like to start by saying that I have been following up the child of the police officers responsible for the murder of George Floyd. Even this murder case, which has made international headlines, it seems that law enforcement agencies and police officers who are being held accountable for crimes that they have committed, um, there is this immunity. So that is my question, thank you. So it sounds like you want to know why, uh, why there is this immunity, right? And why it's difficult to yeah, prosecute why is still um, why is there still immunity and why is it so difficult to hold police officers and um, law enforcement agencies accountable for crimes that they've committed? Great question. Thank you, Nora. All right, Jose, do you want to take that? Happy to. That's a very good question. So prosecutors work with police hand in glove. And in many communities, they feel that law enforcement is a trusted part of that community. This view obviously changes when we ask people of color who are over police and oftentimes bear the brunt of excessive use of force. This trusted position in communities and laws set aside to protect law enforcement are the reasons why we see such a small number of officers convicted, even indicted of excessive use of force. And I'll just add that in terms of immunity, where we see immunity is in civil cases because there's this court created doctrine of qualified immunity that states that in order for a case to move forward against a law enforcement officer, there must be an almost identical case where they were, where the officer in that case was found to be have to, to was found to have acted illegally, and so this qualified immunity is one of the asks that we're asking Congress to reform, and it's one of the four um, asks on the leave behind that you can ask your member of Congress whether or not they support. And thank you for that really good question. All right, thank you, Nora. And I think we might have a little bit of time to answer just one more question. Annie, is there another question in the chat that we can answer with the time we have left? Yeah, I think we've got just another minute left. So I think end on a really great question. Hannah asks, what does it mean to demilitarize the police? Um, yeah, Jose or Cameron. Cameron, it sounds like you wanted to jump in. Go ahead. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, what we were talking about um, regarding the 1033 program, how there's so much military grade equipment and weapons and vehicles transferred to our, our local police department. 
we're starting to see this overall cultural shift in police from being what they were intended to be um, were supposed to be in society as guardians. Now it's more a warrior mentality that us versus them that we're seeing because these local police departments are outfitted in military equipment and weapons and, and outfits. So it really changes the mindset of how police interact with communities in a very militarized us versus them way. So when we say demilitarize the police, we're saying let's make sure that our police be the guardians that they're supposed to be and not the offensive warriors with um, military grade weapons. And the way that we can do that is reform the 1033 program. Thank you for that question. Thank you. All right, well, at this point, um, oh, it looks like I'm getting a message from YouTube headquarters. We actually do have one more question. I was gonna transition us, uh, but go <laughs> ahead, Annie, please ask us another question. Yeah, sorry about that, Larissa. I lost track of time over here at YouTube headquarters because there's just so much great dialogue happening that I thought we were out of time, but we actually have a little bit more time I was wondering if we could get either Cameron or Jose to, you know, restate for us, what is the ask? What are the four provisions? Um, and really like, what is the top line thing that we want people to remember as, as they're going into offices on Monday? I'll throw it over to whoever wants to start. You want to start Cameron? Yeah, absolutely. So remember our, legislative ask for Congress for Spring Lobby Weekend is to pass the meaningful reforms included in the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which is H.R. 1280. And those four reforms that we'll be advocating for and making sure we highlight in our lobby visit, um, our visits on Monday and getting our positions from our members on each provision are one, banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants, two, um, sorry, two, reforming qualified immunity, three, reforming the 1033 program, and four, requiring de-escalation techniques and raising the use of force standard. And those are gonna be in all your documents everywhere where you can keep referencing before Monday. Jose, do you wanna add anything to that? What would you say is our top line that you want people to take away from all of the conversation that we just had? I would say that their advocacy is so important and, and, and it's so key because we are crossing partisan lines where advocating with Democrats and Republicans. And we see that we need that support in the Senate uh, to get both parties on board because not every Democrat is in, it has supported um, the bill yet. And um, once we see it introduced in the Senate, we're gonna need a lot of help with Republicans as well because we need 10 more Republicans to, to support the bill so that it can move forward. Thank you. Thank you both and thank you, Annie, and thank you to everyone who asked questions. I'm sure there are more questions, but remember that there are office hours with Jose and Cameron both today and tomorrow, and you can check that out at fcnl.org slash SLW schedule. So at this point, we are going to take another very quick break. Please uh, stretch your legs, get coffee. Maybe I'm going to drink a little bit of water. And then when we come back, we are going to dive into what storytelling is and what exactly a lobby visit sounds like. So we'll see you in just a bit. And we're back after another short break. Um, I finished my water and I am now replenished and ready to keep going with y'all. We are gonna talk about storytelling. I really hope that you are paying attention to Jose and Cameron because knowing all the details of the ask will help you have even more intentional lobby visits. But I am also now here to say Cover your ears, Jose and Cameron, please, that it's okay if you forget something about the bill. It's okay if you don't know how to answer a question about the legislation. 
we have created that one page leave behind with the ask written on it and the provisions of the bill so that you can use it as a reference and then email it to your congressional offices after you've spoken with them. At the end of the day, our stories are the power that we bring into congressional offices when we lobby our legislators. And the stories that we tell are impactful for two reasons. First, members of Congress and their staff are faced with numbers, policy briefings, and statistics on a daily basis. Constituent stories, therefore, stand out because they bring to life those statistics in a way that briefings can't. According to a study done by the Congressional Management Foundation, telling your story directly to a legislative office in a lobby visit has the most potential to influence them compared to, let's say, writing letters or even calling the office and leaving a message. We are reminding them of the people not the numbers at the end of their policy decisions. Second, as constituents, we play a unique role in the policymaking process. Members of Congress do their best to be informed on all the issues that might affect constituents, but remember that they're people too. It is quite possible and highly likely that there are issues they don't know a lot about, realities lived by constituents in their state or district that they aren't fully aware of or educated on. And that's where we come in. Telling our stories provides even more clarity and context for the decisions members of Congress have to make. And sometimes you might be the first person to point the member towards a certain issue. That has happened to me. I have been in lobby visits where I found myself educating a staffer for what seemed to be the first time on an important bill. Constituent voices are critical for passing meaningful legislation. So, what exactly do we mean by stories? It's pretty simple, actually. Your story is an answer to the question, why do you care about this issue? What has called you to work on this issue and be so passionate about it? It's clear that we are all here because we are committed to ending police violence, but why are we so committed? If you had to put it into words, what would you say? The answer to this question might not come to you right away. So I have three examples of stories that will help you in forming your own. Each story is less than two minutes long and yours should be just as short. In a lobby visit that might only last 15 minutes total, it is so important to leave time for all the information that you need to share. Um, not all lobby visits might be this short, but we do tell constituents to expect 15 to 20 minutes because staffers are busy and schedules change. And if that's the amount of time that we have, we want to make sure that we are saying everything that we want. Um, and that's why it's so important to keep some of this kind of short. Um, before we proceed with these examples, I wanna share that some of these stories will recount instances of police violence. Um, besides the person speaking, there will be nothing displayed on the screen. So there will be no um, visuals of what they're saying, but I do encourage you to do what you need in order to maintain your emotional safety as we share stories with each other. So the first type of story is one that usually comes to mind right away, and that is one of impact. You care about this issue because it has directly impacted you, a loved one, or your community. One caution about telling a story of impact, however, is if you are talking about how this impacted someone else, you should never share ideas, only ideas. 
Never reveal the identity of others or share details of their stories in your lobbying unless you have received permission from them first. We'll listen to an example from Grace Green, a former Advocacy Corps organizer, so you can hear what this type of story sounds like. Hi, my name is Grace Green, but y'all probably know me as Gigi. I moved to Seattle, Washington from Baltimore, Maryland almost two years ago. I am lobbying with hundreds of other young adults at FCNL Spring Lobby Weekend to help end police violence. I am a founding member and early entry kindergarten teaching fellow at Impact Public Schools Salish Sea Elementary School in Seattle. Now, unfortunately, I am a direct witness to police violence at the Seattle protests that took place last summer. The violence was overwhelming and shocking. I went to the protests all summer because I was tired of seeing so many people who look like me dying from excessive force by police. I went downtown to Capitol Hill with a mask. On it, I wrote, I can't breathe in honor of George Floyd and Freddie Gray and all of the names of victims from police violence. I witnessed Seattle police that were barricaded from peaceful protesters like myself throw tear gas and push forcefully against us. These police were antagonizing and intimidating protesters who were in deep grief. Trying to get away from the chaos inflicted by police, I ran in many directions. The sight of an army of police charging directly five feet from me caused a panic. I nervously jumped into a car of a stranger that had managed to park close and kindly offered rides outside of what turned into a war zone. What I experienced that day was a clear reminder that our police are militarized. And I saw the violent impact this had right in front of my eyes. The Seattle community and specifically the black and brown people that live there should never experience this violence. This is why I am here to ask that you co-sponsor and pass the meaningful reforms in the Justice and Police Act, HR 1280. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Gigi for sharing that story with us. Notice that she didn't just tell her story, right? She also introduced herself at the beginning gave some quick context into her connection to Seattle, Washington, and then ended by saying our ask. These are important details to remember when it is your turn to tell a story during the lobby visit. The offices don't know you, so take a moment to establish that. The next type of story is one of urgency. Um, I think this story is probably self-explanatory. It is one that makes clear why action needs to be taken on this issue now. And, and that is the focus of, of this type of story. So to give an example, we have Giselle Lopez Estrada, another former advocacy court organizer. Hi, my name is Giselle Lopez Estrada and I'm a student at the University of Texas at Austin. I am lobbying with the Friends Committee on National Legislation for meaningful reform that will help end police violence. I found that in, these, in just these two and a half months of 2021, there have been eight people killed by the police in Texas, one of them being killed by the Austin Police Department. Since 2013, 813 people have been killed in Texas by the police. I witnessed this issue firsthand in the summer of 2020 when me and my fellow Dallasites were viciously attacked with tear gas and rubber bullets by the Dallas Police Department and Texas State Troopers for simply demanding justice. This issue is urgent and we cannot wait any longer for meaningful change and legislation. Earlier this month, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act passed the House for a second time. This same bill was passed in the House in 2020 and was never acted on by the Senate. This is your opportunity to make sure that Congress does not fall short on passing meaningful reforms, such as banning chokeholds and no-knock warrants. For that reason, I am here with other Texas constituents and hundreds of young adults from around the country asking you to co-sponsor and pass the meaningful reforms included in the Justice and Policing Act, HR 1280. Thank you for your time and attention. 
Thank you, Giselle, for sharing your story with us as well. Notice how Giselle not only talked about urgency, right? She also briefly mentioned police violence that she had directly witnessed in her community. And you might be thinking, okay, well, we just went over impact stories. That sounds very similar. There is no formula for telling a perfect story. Your story is yours and you shouldn't be trying to fit it perfectly into one of these categories. There might be elements of all three of these types of story in your story. Um, these, I, I would think of these more like prompts to get you thinking about what you, uh, what you want to say to that question, why do you care so much about this issue? Um, if you, for some reason, are having trouble answering that in a you know, succinct way or, or you're thinking to yourself, I don't have a story, you definitely have one. And that's why we have these three types to, to help you figure out where yours might land and, and help you uh, figure out how you might wanna tell yours. So the last type of story is one of identity slash values. So this means you care about this issue because of your identity as a student, as a person of faith, as a person of color, as an educator, as a sibling, et cetera. By leading with our values, we can find common ground through the humanity that we all share. And as Quakers, through the God that lives in all of us. Caring about an issue because of the values you hold is a story to tell. To give an example of that type of story, we have Katie Thurston, another former advocacy court organizer, telling us her story. Hi, I'm Katie, and I'm a graduate student at Clemson University, originally from Jacksonville, Florida, and I'm lobbying with the Florida delegation as part of Spring Lobby Weekend. When I'm asked to describe myself, I always say I'm a camp person because as a summer camp director, I'm not only able to facilitate amazing out-of-school time experiences for youth, but also serve my community while fostering my own sense of creativity. At camp, we often say camp's a bubble, but the real world still seeps in. In the real world, members of my community are subject to chokeholds, no-knock warrants, brutality and injustice every day at the hands of the police. As an educator, as a person of faith, as a person who believes Black Lives Matter, and as a camp director, I am called to work for the world we seek, and I seek a world without police violence. For that reason, I am asking you to co-sponsor and pass the meaningful reforms included in the Jefferson Police Act, H.R. 1280. Thank you for listening. One more thank you to Katie for uh, sharing her story with us, as well as again to Gigi and Giselle. I'll take this moment to quickly point out that each of them has mentioned Spring Lobby Weekend and the hundreds of us that are lobbying together to end police violence. This doesn't necessarily have to be said in every story, but saying it at least once during the lobby visit will be important. We want these offices to know just how loud our collective voice really is and just what it is that we accomplished this weekend, right? We did this y'all and we wanna make sure that our um, offices know just how powerful our network really is. Finally, I will say that you should never share what you are not comfortable sharing. That's another reason I love having these three types of stories. Some of us are approaching this issue with more vulnerability than others, with more lived experience than others. But that doesn't mean that some of us should be expected to bear our souls in these lobby visits more than others. There are different ways to tell a story and you should tell the story that feels right to you. All of these examples will be sent out via email and will appear on our lobby resources page. Again, that's fcnl.org slash SLW resources. Um, and we're, we are gonna talk about that, that page again in just a second. So that brings us to what will a lobby visit actually sound like? And how do these stories fit into that structure? 
So for this part, I want to bring back Hannah Sievers, our program assistant for young adult outreach, to talk to us about the basics of a lobby visit. Thank you, Hannah. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Larissa. Um, to start us off, I want everyone to type in that link that Larissa just said, fcnl.org slash SLW resources, which Annie is just putting in the chat again for you. Um, take a look at that and all the lobby visit materials there. You will see in that link the lobby visit roadmap, the one pager Larissa just mentioned about the Justice and Policing Act and very important lobby visit report back. I'm going to take us through the lobby visit roadmap now because this will be how you structure your lobby visits in your state trainings right after this at 2 p.m. Eastern time. The first page of the roadmap is to help you write down the logistics of the lobby visit and to figure out the roles that people need to take on. The logistics of the visit are in the Google Doc that was sent to you via email by Justin Hurdle or Claire Carter. You should have already received this information, but if you did not, you can email jhurdle at fcnl.org. Annie will put his email in the chat now. Now, the two roles listed on that first page are the group leader and note taker. Let's start with the note taker. This is the most important role in a visit, even though it's not a speaking role. This person must take thorough notes in order to fill out the report back form after you've met with the office. Jose and Cameron will be able to look through all of these reports and use this information that we get from the offices on Monday to make our advocacy even more effective as we continue to push for meaningful reforms after this event. The note taker will also follow up with the office via email after the lobby visit. The other role you see listed on the first page is the group leader. The group leader is the person that facilitates the visits. They are the ones that introduce the group and keep track of what step of the roadmap you are on to make sure the visit is flowing smoothly and that your group is able to get through everything you practice. On the second page of the roadmap, you will see the recommended lobby visit structure laid out step by step. Notice that the note taker and delegation leader are not the only role. As you go through the roadmap, you'll see that your group needs two to three storytellers. And there are other opportunities for speaking too, such as introducing the ask and thanking the office for something. We are about to show you exactly what it sounds like when you go through this roadmap in a video we recorded. You'll hopefully see at the end of the day, a lobby visit is just a conversation between constituents and a congressional office. Spoiler alert, you will see some familiar faces in this lobby role play. everyone, we're going to do a lobby visit role play. And this is so you feel comfortable going into your visits. You know exactly what it's going to sound like or look like. Let's go over the roles. I'm going to pretend to be a congressional staffer who works for Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. And my colleagues, Hannah, Cameron, and Bobby are going to be the constituents who will lobby me. Okay, here we go. Let's practice our lobby visit. <clears throat> Once the phones are to our ear, We'll be ready to go and start. Hi, everyone. My name is Larissa from Senator Paul's office. Hi, Larissa. How are you doing? I'm doing OK. Things are super busy today, but I am really happy to be speaking with some of the senator's constituents. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today with everything that's going on. My name is Hannah and I'm joined here by my friends Cameron and Bobby. We are here as a part of the Friends Committee on National Legislation's Spring Lobby Weekend. Hundreds of attendees are lobbying their members of Congress today to address police violence. There are 20 of us on the line, but only three of us will be speaking. Wow, that's great. Before we get started with the meeting, how much time do you have to speak with us today? 
Thanks for checking. I know that this is scheduled for 30 minutes originally, but something has come up, so I only have about 10 minutes. Great. Well, we wanted to first thank Senator Paul for introducing the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act in 2020. Banning no-knock warrants through legislation like this is super important, and we are happy to hear that Senator Paul agrees and took steps to make it happen. I'm really glad that you mentioned that, Hannah. It is a really important issue for the Senator. Yeah, I'm gonna turn it over to Cameron to let you know what we'd like to speak with you about today. Hi, this is Cameron. Hi, Larissa. We're speaking with you today because we'd like Senator Paul to co-sponsor and pass the Meaningful Reforms included in HR 1280, the Justice and Policing Act. This issue is so important for us right now as black and brown people across the nation experience brutalization at the hands of the police every single day. We need to take action immediately. Thanks, Cameron. Now I'll invite Bobby to share his perspective on the issue. Thanks, Hannah. Larissa, I'm Bobby, and I wanna see the Justice and Policing Act passed because as a Quaker and a social worker, I believe in a peaceful world free from violent militarized police forces. No one should be afraid of the people sworn to serve and protect them. As a college student in Louisville, I advocated to end the 1033 program and halt police militarization. I saw how bringing assault rifles, tactical gear, and armored vehicles into our neighborhoods made the police seem more like an occupying force than protectors. It undermined trust in the community and led to undue violence in our towns and cities, violence that could be mitigated by passing the Justice and Policing Act. We can't just keep giving local law enforcement all these sorry, weapons. Sorry, oh. sorry, Bobby. Um, great points, but since Larissa mentioned that she only has a few minutes, I'm gonna pass it over to Cameron. Oh, oh, sure, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Bobby. Hi again, Larissa. My name is Cameron Point from Lexington, Kentucky. I'm a Black and Indigenous woman of the Lumbee and Wakamasuan tribes in North Carolina. This issue affects me personally because I worry every day about something happening to me or my loved ones, not because we've done anything wrong, but because both Black and Native people are victims of police brutality at an alarming and disproportionate rate. So I think about getting a phone call that something happened to my brother because he was simply wearing a hoodie or that I might be shot lying in bed because we're Black. The Justice and Policing Act is an important first step in addressing police violence and the militarization of the police. Thank you for sharing that, Cameron. Hi, um, this is Hannah again. Uh, much of this country has focused on police violence since the murder of George Floyd in May of 2020, but we know that police violence has plagued our country long before this. I remember the images that came out of the protests in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014. These took place six years ago when police murdered Michael, an unarmed black teenager. Nothing was done to demilitarize the police then, although we saw military grade weapons and equipment used on civilians. Even before that, in the decades and centuries of violence, nothing has been done. As local movements push for the meaningful change, we have an opportunity and responsibility to ensure that all 18,000 jurisdictions with law enforcement are taking nation nationwide measures to help end police violence. I'd love to hear from you, Larissa. Does the Senator support the Justice and Policing Act that just passed the House? Yeah, Hannah, thank you for sharing that. And I'll just thank Bobby and Cameron again for sharing these stories with me. It is so important for us to hear from constituents. I'll be sure to pass these stories along to the Senator. Uh, he really does want to hear about what his constituents care about. I'm unfortunately not that familiar with the bill that you mentioned, so I will have to do some research, read it before fully giving you an answer. But generally speaking, Senator Paul supports addressing these bad apples being dealt with on the local level. We don't want to put many restrictions on states. It's Cameron here. That's great to hear that Senator Paul acknowledges the problem of police violence. I just have a question, Larissa. If he doesn't support the Justice and Policing Act, which of the specific elements listed in our leave behind does he support? We're working on banning chokeholds, banning no-knock warrants, reforming the 1033 program, reforming qualified immunity, raising the use of force standard, and requiring de-escalation techniques. Wow, uh, it sounds like that bill does a lot. And um, 
Within what you just said, I know that Senator Paul is serious about banning no-knock warrants, which is why he introduced the Justice for Breonna Taylor Act. It's good to hear that Senator Paul has taken a first step in addressing police violence. Banning no-knock warrants is critical, um, but we hope that the Senator will take a look at the other reforms in this bill, as all of them are important to help set a na national standard while advocacy is also being done on a local level. It's Cameron again. I have another question. Is police reform and police militarization an issue that the Senator hears about from his constituents frequently? Um, you know, it isn't a top issue that he hears from people about. People seem to be most concerned about health care and the economy. So I'm really sorry. I actually do have to hop on another call in a few minutes. But again, thank you for sharing this information with me. I'll make sure to pass it along. Great. Yeah, we're almost wrapped up. I believe Bobby has one more point he'd like to share. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Larissa. Uh, you know, we all saw the video of the murder of George Floyd. Down in Louisville, we're a fairly conservative community, as you well know, but I would say most of us feel we have to address this issue of police violence. And that's really why we're here today. I would really love to be able to tell my community what the Senator is willing to do. Thank you, Bobby. That's really important. And it's good to hear that there are uh, there's more concern in the community about this issue. Again, that's something I will absolutely have to report to Senator Paul. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Bobby will be sending you that follow-up email and we would love to follow up with you in a week. Sounds good to me. I'll hopefully have more information for you then. Thank you again for chatting with me today. Thanks, Larissa. We really appreciate it. All right, everyone, that was our role play. I hope that I can take you through just two things that went really well that we want you all to do on your visits. And one thing that could have been improved that hopefully you'll all catch for your visits on Monday. So first, a lot of you will be on telephone conference call. We were all on the phone. And for that reason, people won't know who's speaking unless you announce yourself, say your name before you speak. And notice that everyone did that. Second, when I started to push back as a staffer saying that we can't support that bill, I don't even know what the bill is, they immediately went to the provisions within the bill in order to have an even more intentional conversation. And that will be really important if y'all are receiving pushback. And finally, they could have said the bill more than once. I think we heard HR 1280, Justice and Policing Act, right at the beginning. Make sure you say it at the end too, to kind of wrap it all up and remind the staffer what exactly you're talking about. I hope this was helpful y'all and good luck lobbying on Monday. Hi again, just wanted to let you know that those points and all of those stories of, within that video will be emailed around tonight and tomorrow, as will the three types of storytelling videos. You'll also be able to find them at that same link, fcnl.org slash SLW resources later tonight. So if you need that refresher, once your day of training is done, you will be able to access those between now and your visits on Monday. You'll be using the lobby visit roadmap in these groups. So be sure to have that handy. Your group facilitator will go through the roadmap with you and you will assign roles, choose stories to tell, and make sure everyone is prepared for your Senate and House visits. You are all gonna do awesome on these lobby visits and I can't wait to see how they go. I'll send it back now to you, Larissa. Thank you, Hannah. And I know that we had a lot of fun <laughs> recording that role play video, so I hope it was helpful for everyone. Notice that we did choose a uh, senator that we know will push back. And we really wanted to model what that would sound like since we talked about it so much. So thank you again, Hannah. Today and tomorrow, there will be lobby office hours. You've heard us say this multiple times. So if you have lingering questions, please take advantage of this time. You will also have additional regroup time on Sunday for those who want to meet with their lobby groups one last time before Monday. All right, before we move on to our lobby training at 2 p.m. Eastern, I have three reminders. 
First of all, I'm being told we already have a lot of birds of a feather requests. Again, those are the groups that we'll meet tomorrow to help you find other young adults at this event that share similar identities or interests as you. Um, we will confirm the groups tonight by 8 p.m. Eastern. There are seven spaces and there are three that were already um, assigned. So unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, we have a lot of people interested in, in submitting ideas, but unfortunately, we can only take four. And so tonight, we will confirm what those four are and email them out. Please continue to send in ideas if you have them. And that is um, the link to do that is fcnl.org slash feather. Remember also, second reminder, to get your secret word at the end of every Zoom session that you have. So that's gonna be the training that's happening again at 2 p.m. Eastern or uh, the workshops that you'll do later. There will be um, a secret word in the office hours as well. So please make sure that you are recording those and sending in your daily survey at the end of every day. If you don't have that in your inbox, we did email uh, the first survey last night. You can find them at fcnl.org slash SLW schedule. And if you're trying to re remind yourself of what the different prizes are or what it is that you have to do in order to get the certificate and the t-shirt, you can find that information at fcnl.org slash SLW prizes. All of these chats are being very expertly placed or all of these links are being expertly placed in the chat by Annie. So a uh, final reminder, third reminder, please remember that the passcode for all Zoom meetings, you will be asked for a passcode. It is in all caps, SLW 2021. So that is SLW 2021. That is the passcode for every Zoom meeting that you will um, attend. Thank you all so much for being here. Again, we have, I guess, about 20, 22 minutes before the training. This is a much longer break than <laughs> before. So please take advantage, um, do what you need to get ready for the lobby training that will start at 2 p.m. Eastern. And right at that time, you can click on the Zoom link that was provided to you that you can also find on the schedule page. Um, so, or, or I guess the lobby page so that you can um, attend your lobby training. Good luck, and I hope you all have a great time. Bye.